uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to this morning's World Economic Series webinar. Uh, the World Economic Series sponsored by Public Policy Projects in partnership with The Diplomat magazine, uh, which I think this audience will know has circulated in the London diplomatic community uh, for over 70 years. Also joined this morning in partnership with Signa Insurance, and we shall be uh, hearing later in the webinar uh, from Dr. Peter Mills, the medical director of Signa. We're delighted to be joined, however, this morning by uh, someone whose uh, job description we put in the invitations to this webinar as the European Union's first ambassador to London, probably a job description in truth that uh, uh, Yaoi Bali de Almeida would prefer not to have had in life, but nonetheless is a reflects the distinction and confidence uh, that uh, the ambassador has generated over a long career as a leading diplomat within uh, the European Union. And we shall uh, be coming uh, to the ambassador in a moment. We're joined by the ambassador and we hope also to be joined by Martin Verve, who's the Director General of Economic and Financial Affairs uh, for the European Commission. The purpose of these webinars is to bring together the diplomatic community, the business community, and the public service community in order to look at the economic implications alongside the health implications of COVID and look to see how we can build a future uh, for ourselves in Britain, but also the wider uh, world as part of the international community. And we're very pleased to be able to welcome so many ambassadors and representatives of London diplomatic missions uh, to this webinar. We shall be looking to have a discussion in the second half of our hour together, uh, but our, the first half is to hear the presentations uh, that I'm about to introduce. Before I do that, a couple of housekeeping points. Please keep yourselves on mute unless you're contributing to the discussion. Please indicate through the chat function if you wish to participate in the discussion. And please also observe the house rule, which is that the presentations are made public uh, following this webinar, uh, but the conversation is very definitely under the chat house rule. So enough from me. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome uh, the Ambassador of the European Union to London to this webinar. Yao Vale de Almeida, uh, before he became Ambassador to uh, London, was, has been the e European Union's representative both in Washington and at the uh, United Nations. And before that, he served as the Chief of Staff and Principal Advisor to President Barroso when he was President of the European uh, uh, Commission, so I should say of the Council. So Ambassador, you're extremely welcome to this webinar and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you all the, those that contributed to organizing uh, this uh, virtual uh, meeting. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here so early in the morning. So thanks for your interest about about the subjects we're going to try to address. I'm, I hope to be joined by my colleague Martin Verrier uh, from Brussels. He's leading all our work in terms of economic and financial affairs and uh, very much linked to our efforts regarding uh, the economic recovery following the, the COVID crisis. Let me, be, let me try to be telegraphic in addressing uh, a vast uh, series of uh, elements that you asked me to touch upon. And I will say that we are, we are certainly not living in normal times, and I think we should be very much aware of that. Uh, what, what do I mean by this? I mean, we have a global pandemic, we have a global uh, recession. Both the pandemics and the recession are unprecedented. And on top of this, we had a difficult divorce uh, between uh, uh, major uh, economies and major uh, global players, and by that I mean uh, Brexit. The European Union is faced with enormous uh, challenges, like many other countries around the world. I think, in uh, very sincerely, I think we are rising to the challenge. And the challenge is, of course, uh, huge. Uh, you know, thinking this morning about I, how I could put it in, in a more 
uh, you know, visual and optical attractive way, I, I think we, we feel like, uh, you know, piloting a plane uh, in the middle of a storm, that's relatively obvious. But at the same time, we are having serious problems with one of our engines. And, uh, and in doing all this, we want to be sure that we land safely, but not in any kind of uh, highway or uh, secondary airport. We want to land in a very solid airport field where we can continue our agenda and look forward to uh, the future of our citizens and our businesses. So this is the kind of, uh, of uh, times we are living in uh, today. So they, we need to, to rise to the challenge. I think the European Union is doing its, its best. Let me say a few words about each of these elements, pandemics, uh, recovery, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Brexit. Again, in a telegraphic way. If I look at pandemics, what I see, I see uh, a first element of it was the surprise with the, the, the dimension of the challenge, but immediately reaction, uh, prevention, uh, the purpose of containing the pandemics as much as we could, save lives, obviously, first uh, top uh, priority, invest in research so that we, have, we can have a long-term solution for the problem, that is a vaccine, uh, but also uh, uh, very clearly and very early in the process, trying to address the side effects of this pandemic and particularly the, the very deep and, and vast effects on, the, on our economy. Uh, we're talking about, if you look at Europe, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of an 8%, in, on average, 8% reduction of our, uh, of our wealth, uh, of our gross domestic product in, in 2020 with repercussions deep repercussions in many sectors of activity, and particularly as far as employment uh, is, is concerned. We have acted at different levels, member states, national level, European level, but also uh, the central banks and the European Central Bank in particular, and the financial supervisors, trying to stabilize uh, 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 the, the situation, preserve our economic uh, potential uh, during this very long uh, lockdown. And we quickly move to a, a, a recovery mode. We qu quickly move to, to action on how about to come out of this, of this uh, recession and this crisis in the best possible uh, conditions. And here the words that come to mind is magnitude, the magnitude of our package that is going to be discussed and hopefully agreed uh, uh, this, uh, this weekend in Brussels by uh, the leaders of the European Union. So magnitude, innovation, if you look at the package with discussion, there are elements which are totally unprecedented in terms of the tools that you use and the principles that we accept to, to follow. But also a, an important element, which I think should be in our discussion today, which is the, the coherence with the long term. It's not only taking measures now with a short term effect, it's for it to be coherent with our global a long-term strategy. It has to be green, it has to be digital, and it has to be resilient. Um, but I think we should also, in doing all this, learn lessons from the pandemics, uh, as far as the health systems are concerned, but also about the autonomy of European economies regarding other partners in the world. The whole discussion about uh, why aren't we producing a single milligram of paracetamol in in European countries is, is a relevant question and everything that flows from, from that. One word on the financial sector, because I know many colleagues work in this area. I think, I think we need to say, if I, if I compare with the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, 10, uh, which I followed as a, as a G8 and G20 Sherpa intensively, I can tell you, uh, I think I see a lot of difference. I see a much more resilient financial sector. I see, uh, uh, the fact that the financial sector today is not part of the problem and it can be, and we are asking it to be part of the solution, uh, contrary to uh, the, the financial crisis that I was referring to. Although we know that improvements are still needed and we are working at European level to, to address uh, some of these uh, problems that will have uh, inevitably impact on, on the economy, on the real economy, if I may call it that way. A word on, on Brexit. Um, well, I would say that in normal times, it was not a good idea. In times like this, I think it's an even worse idea. But this is my opinion, and of course the opinion of the European Union. 
uh, we, we regret Brexit, but we respect, we fully respect the democratic decision made in, in, in Britain to, to withdraw from the European Union. And we need to approach this reality with, uh, with realism, with pragmatism, and trying to find the best uh, solutions. So the negotiations on the future relationship have entered a, a second cycle, I would say, uh, in a more sophisticated way, uh, trying to find the, uh, the right uh, consensus. Today, as we speak, uh, David Frost and his team are in Brussels. Next week, Michel Barnier and his team will come to London. So we are uh, working hard to try to find the right compromises that would allow us to, uh, to, to start a new cycle in our relationship the 1st of January of next year. Let me leave with you a few messages. First, a deal is better than a no deal. And we are absolutely convinced of that. And we will do our best uh, to reach a deal, not any kind of deal. We want an ambitious deal and a, a deal that is commensurate to the, the importance of the European Union and the United Kingdom and the relevance of our cooperation in the future. So we'll be the last ones to, uh, to turn off the lights. You know, we will never give up in our search for, uh, for a deal uh, in the next uh, weeks and months. But I must say very clearly, if there is no chance of a deal, we are ready for the no deal. And uh, uh, it will have negative impact on both sides. I guess it will be more impactful on the, on the British side than our side for obvious reasons. But uh, we don't want a no deal. We'll be ready for a no deal if that is, is the case. But for the moment, we are fo fully focused on finding the right solutions. One thing is clear, and I want this to be very clear also to our British friends, we'll never sell out our single market. This is a, 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 the jewel in the crown of the European Union, for which, by the way, uh, uh, Great Britain has greatly contributed. Uh, uh, and, but you can understand, we cannot risk uh, uh, you know, uh, the internal market for the sake of a negotiation with a country that chose to leave uh, not only the European Union, but also the single market. Uh, there is not much time left. We are under pressure because Britain uh, decided not to uh, extend the transition period. So we have a few months. We need to have a deal by October. Uh, we are hard working to get there. Uh, we only hope that the same kind of commitment, I'm sure it is there, will be uh, revealed in the negotiations by, by our British friends. I'll stop here because I'm sure there'll be questions later on. And uh, again, thank you for the, the opportunity. Ambassador, thank you very much. If I may say so, I think you've given a masterful uh, summary of the issues in an extraordinarily short period of time. You've said how uh, broad ranging the agenda is, but you've uh, made it, you've telegraphed your interest in the full range of that agenda. Uh, you touched on your, in your contribution, the role of central banks and the financial sector. And um, that's the area of specialism of our second guest this morning. Uh, uh, joining us from Brussels, the Director General of the Economic and Financial Affairs Directorate of the European Commission and formerly from the Dutch uh, Finance Ministry, Martin Verve. Uh, Martin, if you are on, as I hope you are, I can't actually see you on the screen, but you're extremely welcome. And we look forward to what you have to say, Martin Verve. Okay, uh, thank you. Very you are much. here. Excellent. I, I, I'm here. I, uh, I hope that I can start my video. Yes. Um, I, I had some trouble uh, dialing in, but, but uh, I'm here and I'm, I'm delighted to, 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 to be here. I, I uh, would like to, to uh, focus my intervention essentially on, uh, on, on three points. Uh, one is the, the economic outlook for the EU, uh, then uh, briefly on the short and medium term risks as we see it, and then uh, a brief word on the EU crisis uh, response. But let, let me start with, uh, with the economic uh, outlook. The, uh, the ambassador touched on it already uh, briefly. Uh, last week, uh, the Commission uh, published its uh, updated forecast for the EU economy. And uh, it actually showed that our previous already uh, rather or very gloomy forecast of early May had even been too optimistic. Um, so for the EU, we expect for, for 2020 now a drop in GDP of around 8.5%. 
and that was a downward revision from minus seven and a half percent. Now we expect this to be followed by a recovery in in uh, 2021, uh, but this recovery will simply not be strong enough uh, to, to to reach the levels of of GDP that we had in in 2019. And so at the end of uh, 2021, the EU economy will still be smaller than in uh, 2019. And even more worrying, and I will say a, a word about that later on, uh, even more worrying than the general drop in GDP is the fact that the projected outlook for member states differ greatly. So in particular, those member states with big tourist uh, sectors, as you can imagine, uh, like Italy, Spain, uh, also Greece, France, they are particularly hard hit with GDP contractions of uh, close to 11%. Now, our downward revision of the forecast is the result of uh, a number of risks that, that uh, of the materialization of a number of risks that we already identified at the time of our spring uh, forecast in early May. Um, so first is that the external environment uh, turned out to be uh, worse than, uh, than expected this spring. Uh, in particular, a number of emerging countries continue to, uh, to see high growth in infections requiring stricter and longer lockdowns. And we are seeing some cases of also of resurgence of the virus uh, across, uh, uh, across the globe. Um, but more importantly, the, uh, the lockdown period in the EU has lasted longer than we had assumed in our baseline scenario. And also the relaxation, uh, even though it's, it's now uh, gathering steam, was a bit uh, more gradual than, than we had uh, pre predicted. So in our baseline scenario, we assumed a lockdown of six weeks. In reality, it was closer to, to eight weeks. But then on the positive side, uh, the policy response to the crisis since uh, our, the spring forecast has been even more forceful than we, uh, we, we thought, with, with some member states uh, announcing additional measures since, since early May. So now then turning to the short term and medium term risks to, to the union. Um, now, the short-term and medium-term outlook they, they, um, continues to be surrounded by significant risks. And in the short run, like, uh, like anywhere else in, uh, around the globe, uh, the trajectory of the economy will be highly dependent on the trajectory of the virus. Uh, now, compared to, to a month, six weeks ago, uh, things look, look better here on, the, on this side. Uh, but clearly the risk of uh, new outbreaks, a second wave, uh, can, cannot be uh, fully discounted. Now, beyond these more short-term risks, we do have concerns about how the EU will emerge from, from, this, uh, from this crisis. And these concerns have shaped in, in many ways, uh, an important way, the proposal by the Commission. First, um, we, what we see is that this, this crisis has a profound uh, and negative impact uh, on the equity position of uh, the non-corporate sector or the, the non-financial corporate sector. And this uh, will lead, we expect, uh, to a steep increase in, in corporate defaults and uh, further down the line also an increase in, in unemployment uh, level. Now, um, in the in the short run, a lot of this has been cushioned by 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 actions uh, by 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 member states. Um, but but we we nevertheless see in the more longer run that this uh, uh, these corporate defaults could be could be there. And in, in, in any case, even if there are no corporate defaults, uh, simply by the fact that the equity position or the uh, deteriorates, uh, has deteriorated off the corporate, uh, corporate sector. Uh, that means that uh, companies will be more constrained in, uh, in their capacity to invest, to generate jobs uh, going, going forward. And that also may have a negative impact on productivity and employment. Uh, now, in, in preparing the, uh, the package, uh, which I will talk uh, a bit, bit later, we, we made a, a needs assessment. And in that needs assessment, 
we uh, we calculated uh, the equity losses for the non-financial sector corporates at, at 720 billion or more than 700 billion in, in the baseline scenario uh, and, and uh, 1.2 trillion in the most adverse scenario and but this was still based on on the spring forecast so so if we would have to run the, if we would run these calculations again uh, we would suddenly end up uh, with, with, with higher numbers. Um, second, and, and this is, I think, the, the most crucial point, we are very concerned about the prospects for a further widening of divergences between member states in the, in the Union. And, uh, and it's very sad to say, but, but some of the least resilient member states have been uh, the hardest hit by the crisis. Um, and, and, and these these differences were already vis visible at the time of the, the spring forecast and we, we identified them uh, there but but these differences have, have come out even clear uh, more clear uh, in our latest uh, forecast where we see that that some countries uh, well all countries are, are badly hit by by the crisis uh, but still there are big differences between countries already in the first impact and uh, and if you take into account that some of the countries that have been hit uh, particularly hard uh, have had problems uh, in the past with with their, their potential growth, it, it is it is clear that that for a number of countries it will take long to to recover uh, from the crisis if if uh, we're not doing something. And, and, and thirdly, and, and very much related to the previous point, we, we have concerns about the impact on our single market. And, uh, and this, this comes uh, from, from essentially two things. We, we see that member states are in very different positions uh, when it comes to, to, uh, to their capacity to support their, their, their companies. Uh, and uh, so that is one. Um, and, but the, the, second, the second thing is that uh, and this, this relates again back to, to these divergences. Uh, if a part of the, 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 the single market, if, if, if there is no demand, then there's also little to, to export. So, so there is, a, we very strongly feel that we have a common interest actually to make sure uh, that that doesn't happen. And, th and that brings me to the EU uh, crisis response. And, and let me, uh, let me, start by saying and, and the ambassador also alluded to that that i think that the eu crisis response so far has actually been been good and uh like the ambassador i, I have the comparison with the, uh, the first the global financial crisis and then the euro crisis where it proved to be very difficult uh not notably at the political level to to take rapid uh, decisions and bold decisions, uh, and that that contributed to to uh, to the fact that this crisis was deeper and lasted longer than than was strictly speaking uh, necessary. And I think that collectively we have learned lessons from uh, from 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 that period. And uh, so what we have seen uh, is 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 very bold interventions actually at all levels. So this started with uh, with the, the ECB. Uh, which which uh, took very very bold uh, policy actions, but backed up by very substantial fiscal liquidity me uh, measures uh, by member states. And to give you give you an idea, member states so far have taken uh, more than four percent in GDP of, of discretionary fiscal uh, fiscal measures, and have put in place liquidity schemes for, for the corporate sector of worth of around 22% of, of GDP on average. And this has been uh, also complemented with action on the EU level, both in terms of uh, the regulatory environment, which, which created temporary flexibility around the, the, our fiscal rules, but also uh, in relation to our competition framework, but also financially. Uh, right from the start, we, we have made an effort to mobilize every euro that we have in the in the EU budget to help. Uh, so we have introduced full uh, flexibility in, in our structural funds. We created a new instrument uh, of uh, 100 billion uh, to fund short-term work schemes uh, called SURE. 
we reached uh, very rapidly a new agreement on uh, on a new facility, uh, ESM facility, and also on the Pan European Guarantee Fund managed by the EIB. And this was all done in in a matter matter of weeks. Um, now these actions, they were all very welcome, but not enough to 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 address in a convincing way the. Uh, the, the, the risk that, that we, we identified. And again, critical in this respect are these concerns about the economic divergences between uh, the member states. And the, and the fact of the matter is that uh, our member states came to this crisis in very different conditions and, and that uh, for, for a number of member states, uh, given the, the impact of this crisis, it will be difficult to recover quickly on, uh, on their own. And, and I believe that is why the Commission proposed this very ambitious program, Next Generation uh, EU, worth uh, 500 billion in budgetary expenditures and, and 250 billion in loans to be, to be financed by Commission borrowing. Now, for those of you uh, familiar with, with, the, with the EU, and I, I assume uh, most of you uh, are, uh, you know that this is really revolutionary. We, we have had uh, borrowing in the past, but, but always with a view to lend it to member states in need. Uh, this is the first time that we would actually borrow uh, money to, to, to spend. And I believe that this is necessary. It allows the spreading of the financial burden uh, imposed by the crisis over time. It provides an opportunity uh, to support those member states most in need to recover without adding to their already high debt burden. And uh, again, as the ambassador already mentioned, by targeting expenditures in support of green and digital and can actually contribute to the necessary modernization of our economy. So, what we believe is that what Europe needs today is a combination of investments and reforms. Investments to get the economy going again uh, and, and to find, uh, finance the transition to a greener and more productive futures. But, but the reforms are necessary to ensure that the economies are brought permanently on a higher and more sustainable uh, growth path and to increase their resilience. Now, and that, that brings me to, and I'm, I'm almost to the end, but, but that brings me to, to, to the core of the package that, uh, that is on the table now. So, so the, by far the biggest instrument uh, that is proposed is uh, the recovery, so-called recovery and resilience facility. So it is envisaged that under this facility, we would make available 310 billion uh, in terms of investment uh, grants and 250 uh, billion in, in loans to member states. And this money uh, will be used to finance national recovery and resilience plans prepared by member states but agreed by the Commission. And these plans should contain both credible reforms and investments and, and the payments uh, will be based on milestones. Now, in, in, in conclusion, so tomorrow the leaders will convene, uh, the EU leaders will convene here in, uh, in Brussels uh, for the first European Council since the start of the, uh, the Corona crisis. Now, on the table, uh, on the one hand, the, the, the multi-annual uh, budget, uh, but also the next generation EU package. Now, needless to, to say that the stakes are very high, um, but I strongly believe that what is on the table is the right response uh, to this crisis. And I, I'm fairly optimistic that actually leaders will be able to, to reach a, a, uh, a good deal. And let me leave it at this. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much for that uh, presentation of the plans of the Commission. Uh, perhaps, if I may say so, underlining the point that even though Britain is no longer a member of the European Union, as a key trading partner, the plans you've set out and the economic context you set uh, for our largest external trading partner is a uh, major influence on what happens here and underlines, of course, the, the, the connectivity of the global economy. 
And it's against that background I turn now to Dr. Peter Mills, because the reason why we've got these economic challenges, not just in Britain or in the, indeed in the EU, but around the rest of the world as well, is of course driven by a health uh, issue. And Dr. Mills is, uh, uh, is a, a clinician. He was formerly at the Royal Free Hospital in London, uh, and he's now the medical director of Cigna, which is a worldwide uh, medical insurance business. Peter, we look forward to your perspective uh, on the, the fundamental uh, clinical causes, medical causes of the economic challenges that both the ambassador and Martin have uh, talked about. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I will be brief, um, and I want to cover three things. Um, where are we with COVID, and when will all this be over? Is the, is the first one. Uh, how can we return to work and travel and trade as safely as possible? And then thirdly, uh, I look to the future. I look to the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and the question, is this going to happen again? So if we start at the beginning, um, where are we with COVID? Uh, the words unprecedented, extraordinary, exceptional, have been used uh, quite frequently over the last few months. Um, but although this is a new phenomenon for the majority of us, it's not actually unprecedented. Uh, on the, uh, uh, the image on the, uh, uh, up there on the screen at the moment, uh, really is there just to illustrate that humankind has been afflicted by pandemic infections since the beginnings of time. Um, and this really is, is no different to the uh, infectious outbreaks that we've seen uh, for centuries. But what is different now is that we have actually uh, learned a lot uh, about this uh, infectious agent in a very, very short period of time. Um, we have, uh, the global scientific community has been mobilized, and I'd say probably in an unprecedented uh, fashion and speed, to, to really have a better understanding of the biophysiology of the, of the virus and how to treat it. And certainly over the last few months, we are much better now at treating uh, the severe COVID-19 disease, uh, certainly than we were back in uh, February and March of this year. Um, we will, however, I think, continue to see localised outbreaks and regional lockdowns, um, as has recently occurred here in the UK, uh, in Leicester. Um, and I think it is very likely that we will be seeing uh, a second wave uh, come the winter time, uh, come November, December of this year. And a best case scenario, I think, is that we are going to have another 18 months of this uh, until we're in a position uh, to develop, deploy a, a mass vaccination program. So that's where we are um, uh, with COVID-19. Um, but more importantly, um, how can we get back to some sort of normality? And really, this is about minimizing risk. This is not about removing it. There is always going to be risk associated um, with opening up uh, in the face of no cure or no vaccination uh, for an effective agent. But I think there's four elements here that we should uh, be mindful of. And I think the first and the most important is probably risk assessing the individual. Um, everyone is different and not everyone needs to go back to work at the same time. We know there are groups in society who are more likely to have adverse uh, reactions to the infection with the coronavirus. So it's about risk assessing the individual um, to see where do they sit along that continuum. Also, risk assessing the destination that an individual is, uh, is due to go to. Um, as we start to open up travel, both for uh, tourism, but also as part of our day-to-day -day, uh, business activity, we'll have to risk assess the location individuals are going to. What is uh, the infection status like there? What are the local healthcare facilities like there? What 
are is the local and, and, and national governments doing uh, to mitigate against spread. We've heard a lot about testing um, over the course of the last months and without a doubt going back to work, going back to travel is going to uh, require a lot of testing and there's a number of different approaches to testing but ultimately if we are going to be going to new places, going to the office, the one question we need to know is does this individual have the virus now? So the PCR testing is going to be very, very important. Um, and I can see a, a situation where individuals may be being tested once a week to see whether they have the virus and whether they can travel. Um, and here, I think we have a great opportunity to, uh, to have a, a global um, or at least EU-wide trusted certification program where individuals can have their COVID test maybe once a week, maybe once every couple of weeks, um, and show this to authorities, to border control, uh, to help with um, uh, getting people mobilized and moving um, and trading as they have done in the past. Um, the final uh, section is PPE and physical modifications. We need to make sure that we are putting those in place um, that we have adequate supplies, that we're making physical modifications to the places where people congregate. Um, and the, the, the four areas I think will help us with uh, driving um, uh, to a, a more opened up um, and economically active society. So what about the future? Uh, looking at the 10 to 15 years ahead, well, we know, and Max, can we have just the next slide, please? Um, we know um, that infectious agents have been ubiquitous through our history. Um, but actually, if you look at the last hundred years, we can see there's been a number of episodes of what we call zoonotic spillovers, which is where infectious agents tr um, uh, jump from animals to humans. And all of the notable uh, infectious outbreaks in the past hundred years uh, have been due to zoonotic uh, spillover. Why is this? Is this just because we are better able to detect them? I think that's part of, uh, part of the reason. But I think also there is a real increase in the frequency of this happening. Not helped by global warming, uh, not helped by uh, increasing population density in some areas around the world. We've been lucky a few times um, over the last few decades and managed to snuff out some of these um, potential issues quite early. Um, COVID-19 is a reminder of what can happen and I think we are in real danger of this actually happening again sometime in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so without trying to dampen your morning, um, hopefully I've given you a very brief overview um, of COVID, um, what we need to do to open up our economies, um, um, but also some warnings for the future. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. And thank you for summarizing the health background uh, to this discussion.